Thank you, George, and uh, welcome to the Commonwealth Club. Um, I'm just a journalist. I've always wanted to be a judge, so my favorite uh, part here is doing the gavel. Good evening, and welcome to today's meeting of the Commonwealth Club. You can find the Commonwealth Club on the internet at commonwealthclub.org, and you can see the club's videos on YouTube and catch up with the club on Facebook and Twitter. I'm John Diaz, the editorial page editor for the San Francisco Chronicle and your moderator for tonight's program. I'm now pleased to introduce today's speaker, Janet Napolitano, president of the University of California, former Secretary of Homeland Security, and author of a new book, How Safe Are We? Homeland Security Since 9-11. Janet Napolitano served as the U.S. Secretary of Homeland Security from 2009 to 2013. She was the third Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security and the first woman to hold the position. She previously served as Governor of the State of Arizona from 2003 to 2009. And since 2013, she has been president of the University of the California system. So no one ever accused Janet Napolitano of taking the easy jobs. <laughs> Tonight, she's going to be wearing her Homeland Security hat. In her new book, How Safe Are We? Homeland Security Since 9-11, Ms. Napolitano pointedly acknowledges the shortcomings and challenges facing the Department of Homeland Security today from the politicization of border security to our lagging cybersecurity sector. Today, we're going to have a discussion about the evolution of our national security and the best practices for Homeland Security to make this country safer. Please welcome to the Commonwealth Club, Janet Napolitano. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we were talking uh, on the uh, on the in the backstage about some of the issues that are coming up, Janet, and and one of the things that you talked about is even though uh, you know we've gone through 9/11, that there there's still threats out there, the blinking red lights, as you describe in your book. Um, you talked about the idea for maybe a, a pre 9/11 commission or something to to revisit. Give us a sense of where we're lacking. So when we Harken back to uh, the attack of 9-11. Uh, after the attack, a uh, commission was established to, to, to reverse engineer and to identify what had happened uh, and how had that attack uh, come to pass. And uh, the commission report uh, identified all these red flags that had appeared. Um, but the chief critique was that um, our, our leaders, our people in the intelligence community, others involved in security, had suffered from a lack of imagination. Just hadn't seen how foreign nationals coming to the United States, going to flight school, would be able to get on commercial airliners, weaponize those airliners, fly them into iconic buildings like the World Trade Center or the Pentagon. So now, almost 20 years later, we have all kinds of red flags in, uh, in areas where risks have evolved. Uh, so I think, frankly, I, I think the notion that we would have another uh, attack just like 9-11 where aircraft are taken over and flown into buildings, we've shut that off. Um, but uh, new risks have uh, come to the fore. So. Uh, I would put cyber up there, um, and uh, we have all kinds of red flags in that space, um, from hacks, from denial of service attacks, from uh, theft of personal uh, information, all the way up to and including a direct attack on our democracy, uh, which is what happened in the presidential election of 2016. So it seems to me that rather than wait for a massive uh, outage uh, uh, to occur in our hyper-networked world, uh, that we ought, to, we ought to, and this requires leadership from the White House, actually, I think, um, assemble a commission 
to really identify what we need to do. And I put forward in my book 10 different questions that we need to address in the cyber area. Uh, um, from how we organize the federal agencies uh, of our government, uh, any number of which have some relationship to cybersecurity, all the way up to and including um, how we engage with the community of nations, what constitutes an act of cyber warfare, what are the kinds of graduated sanctions that uh, we ought to be considering. So that is one area. Two other areas where risks have evolved um, in the almost 20 years since 9-11. One are the risks associated with global warming and climate change. So you might say, well, what does that have to do with homeland security? Well, homeland security is about protecting the safety of Americans. And um, when you think about it, we have lost more lives due to extreme weather events in the past years than we have through any kind of terrorist uh, attack. Uh, and we see uh, uh, a larger number of landfall hurricanes, greater numerosity and intensity of tornadoes, uh, drought in the West, which has resulted in uh, the wildfires that we experienced here in California. Um, uh, and those are only going to continue uh, to, to increase. And beyond that, as the planet is warming, we're going to see greater changes to migration patterns as the population of the world is basically moving from south to north. Uh, uh, the um, uh, uh, presence of new and emergent diseases and possible pandemic uh, and also things like extreme drought in uh, areas of the world, which has killed local agriculture, killed local markets, uh, resulting in lots of young men uh, who are jobless and hopeless and themselves ripe for terrorist recruitment. And then, and then I think the third area that we don't have a good handle on is mass gun violence. Um, whether it is motivated by some sort of Islamist uh, type ideology, whether motivated by right-wing white nationalist um, ideology, and we've seen more and more of that, whether just a, a result of some kind of pathology. Um, but uh, this is an area where we need to devote attention and study. We really don't have good predictors. Um, and without good predictors, um, we really don't have a good way for early intervention and, and prevention. So uh, th those are three buckets of risks that I think as a, as a country we need to invest some uh, real effort into. I want to drill down in all three areas. Uh, let's start with cybersecurity. I think back to uh, Y2K and all the concern and, and investment that was made in anticipation that we might have a problem when the clock turned over to 2000. And, and you put it in the scale compared to today of how, depend, how much more dependent we are uh, on, on electronics, on digital. Um, where do you see the, what is the greatest dangers you see in cybersecurity in terms of uh, debilitating the United States? So, I, you know, I, I think, John, it's um, uh, the fact that so much of our critical infrastructure is cyber dependent. Our utilities, uh, our banking system, our telecommunication system, our emergency and emergency response systems. So you, you can uh, see where a nefarious actor, uh, and it may be a, uh, a, a uh, a foreign state, it could be uh, a group, it could be uh, some individuals could wreak havoc on entire communities. Think about what would happen in San Francisco if all the traffic lights went out simultaneously, if the 9-11 system were debilitated, um, if people couldn't, uh, if, the, if they couldn't use their phones, uh, if they couldn't access a cash machine or an ATM. Uh, and what would we do? How would the community respond? How would people get information? 
all unanswered questions now. And it's an extraordinarily complicated area because our critical infrastructure is by and large in private sector hands. Um, and uh, so the private sector has to be included in the security planning that we need to be doing. Is Congress really equipped to take on these challenges? I'm thinking back to the hearing. No, we the had Zuckerberg about, hearing, yeah. About a year ago where there was this hearing and uh, it was very clear that, that, <laughs> that they had no clue how, how Facebook or Google worked. And right. know, gee, how, how do you make money with Facebook? And yeah. Mark Zuckerberg <laughs> goes, we sell advertising. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, that was a fairly remarkable exchange. Um, uh, you know, you know that's, you know, uh, listen. Uh, the, um, we have talent in this country, and we have really capable, smart minds. Um, but I think that's why I suggest kind of a pre-9/11 cyber commission, as it were, uh, to bring those talents together. Because I, I, I fear if we leave it to lawmakers. Um, uh, we're going to be a long time from here to any kind of reasonable plan. And if we leave it to the private sector, as we saw with the Russian interference in the uh, 2016 election, they may, they may not be as vigilant as we would like. That's right. And, um, you know, I, I will say that while I, when I was secretary, we certainly could see um, uh, the increasing nature of uh, cyber attacks. We actually did a uh, a, a briefing for uh, members of the Senate on uh, what would happen uh, to the power grid and and how relatively easy it would be to shut down the the, the power grid. Uh, and and it, at the time, we were trying to get some cybersecurity legislation um, passed. Um, we we really didn't see the kind of direct interference in an election by a foreign adversary, such as we saw in 2016. Who is taking, which agency, uh, government department, is taking the lead on cybersecurity? Is it Homeland Security? Is it Department of Defense? So it's, it's any, any and all. Okay. Um, so are, are they uh, coordinating with each other? Not as much as they ought to. Um, uh, so DHS has responsibility for critical infrastructure um, protection, which, as I said, also means uh, you know working with the private sector. Um, uh, the Department of Defense and the NSA um, uh, have responsibility, particularly for the international aspect of cyber, which you know respects no national boundaries. The FBI has responsibility for investigating uh, cyber uh, attacks. Um, the Department of Justice has responsibility for prosecuting them. Uh, but the Department of Energy has a role. The Department of Commerce uh, has a very uh, large role here. Um, and um, there's um, intersecting and overlapping jurisdictions amongst all of those federal agencies. So it's quite the coordination challenge. Where was it in terms of priority when you were in the Obama administration? So I started in, in uh, January of 2009, and it was, I, I, you know, as I think back, uh, cyber, I think, took about 10% of my time. Uh, uh, by the time I left in 2013, it was easily 40% and, and growing. So clearly that sounds like it, it, it was becoming a priority. Yeah, and I was interested to see that the current Secretary Nielsen gave a speech a couple of weeks ago on the state of Homeland Security, and she identified as the top risk to the United States cybersecurity, not, not the southwest border. Um, interestingly enough, I was going to say we, well, we could talk about that. You only named three, isn't that number one? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. No, and 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 actually, the point I try to make in in, in the book is, you know, re homeland security requires uh, a, a, an evidence-based, data-driven approach to risk and where real risks are. Um, and then trying to bring resources to bear on reducing those risks. Um, but it is easily distracted in the political process. And so um, uh, one area that I don't think is a risk 
to the safety and security of the, of the country is the southwest border. The southwest border needs to be secure. It's a zone. It needs to be managed. But I wouldn't put it in, in the category of a, of, a, of, a, of a real threat to safety and security. Well, you have a really interesting uh, inside perspective on that, having been both governor of Arizona and, and head of uh, Homeland Security. Um, what, what do you make of the plan to potentially shut down the, the border? Ah. Um, <laughs> look, um, uh, you know, um, Mexico is the number two or three trading partner of the United States. Uh, we have whole swaths of the U.S. economy that depend on traffic, being able to um, go through those ports um, and are responsible for hundreds and hundreds of thousands of jobs in the United States. Uh, the automobile industry is heavily dependent, its supply chain, uh, on uh, trafficking uh, through the uh, U.S.-Mexican border. Um, agriculture, agricultural products. Um, so if the border were to be shut down, um, you would see an immediate and deep economic consequence uh, to the United States. Uh, and um, for, to, to what end? I, mean, I really have to ask, to, to what end? The same as building a wall. I'm not a big believer in the wall either. Um, uh, when I, yeah, uh, when I was governor, I used to say, show me a 10-foot wall, and I'll show you an 11-foot ladder. <laughs> um, and, and you, you know, when well, you... You know, the, first of all, it's a 1,940-mile border. It crosses lots of different types of terrain. Uh, some of the border is public lands. A lot of it's privately held land. And then there's some sovereign Indian nations that are, are right there and, and go into both countries. Um, the notion of building a physical structure it, that is a symbol, it's not a strategy. Um, a strategy involves analyzing and supporting efforts between the ports of entry and strengthening actual activities at the ports. You mentioned uh, climate as a national security issue. Obviously, it gets entangled in many other aspects as an environmental issue, certainly as an economic issue. But in terms of national security, what do you think should be done uh, in terms of addressing climate change? I mean, we're really at the point now where we're not just trying to prevent it, but dealing with some of the effects. Yeah, so I think we need to look at it in, in two ways. One is we need to rejoin the community of nations and do our part uh, to reduce the rate of climate change. Um, uh, we shouldn't be the only nation out there except, I think, Syria that isn't part of the Paris Accords. We should rejoin join it. The second thing is um, we, uh, adaptation to the global warming that already has occurred. And that is a lot of very practical questions. Uh, where we build our roads, how we construct our bridges, um, what kinds of materials do we use in, in, in uh, building structures? Where do we locate our airport runways? I think of that uh, every time I take off from the Oakland airport and I look out the window of the plane <laughs> and you see the, 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 the rising water. Um, and, you know, and when you know, communities are uh, destroyed by extreme weather events, um, uh, uh, how and whether we rebuild those uh, communities? Do we uh, rebuild them exactly where they were, how they, how they existed bef before the event, uh, or do we rethink uh, location and design? Uh, and, and this requires efforts by uh, our, our local building planners, um, zoning, uh, all, you know, all of the kinds of folks that are involved in the nuts and bolts of how we construct our communities. Was any of that within, any of those policies within the purview of Homeland Security when you were there? I mean, did you, were you able to raise it as a national security issue? Uh, yeah, we began raising it. Um, and, um, you know, we obviously dealt with um, all the aftermath of natural disasters. FEMA is part of the department. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and uh, so we were dealing, and we could see that, that the number of storms increasing, the number of wildfires and the acreage being consumed going up. Uh, we had uh, Superstorm Sandy. Uh, Superstorm Sandy as a hurricane that came up the Atlantic coast uh, it, it, was a it was a huge storm. It covered the size of Western Europe. Um, and the hurricane came right up into New York Harbor and sat there and um, uh, took out the power structure in lower Manhattan and New Jersey uh, and all the way up to uh, upstate New York. Uh, and, um, you know, marshalling the resources and the response uh, uh, to that was, I think, a harbinger of things to come. And uh, you, meant, you, you, know, you talked about that more people have died in some of these natural disasters with climate aggravating it than 9-11. That's also true with gun violence. I mean, in terms of if you look at the, the magnitude of, of the carnage, um, how does that fit in with the na as a national security issue as opposed to a domestic problem? Well, it, 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 is, it is both, um, and, uh, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, as I, as I said, we really don't have good kind of predictors uh, of uh, what causes someone uh, to, say, be trolling uh, social media sites and to go from there to purchasing a combat-ready weapon and going out and, and shooting up a nightclub or uh, shooting up a school. Uh, and, you know, uh, it, it, it almost needs to be addressed like a public health issue um, uh, because it involves real behaviors and behavioral characteristics. Um, and, you know, we have, uh, we have great minds. We have great minds at the University of California. Um, uh, I think we ought to be really thinking our way through how better to um, prevent and intervene. Uh, and by the way, I think reasonable gun safety laws make sense too. Which, which would be among your, your highest priorities in terms of gun safety laws? Background checks? Yes. Restri restrictions on uh, uh, high capacity magazines? Yes. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Um, uh, I, and I think uh, uh, some, some weapons really are not designed for civilian purchase, um, and we ought to be talking about that, dealing with that. I want to get to uh, audience questions in just a second and encourage you, if you have questions for uh, Jen Napolitano, please uh, send them up. Uh, but I wanted to ask you about the Department of Homeland Security. You know, when it came together right after 9-11, a dozen agencies consolidated. Oh, no, 23 agencies. And, and you know, what, 240,000 employees, some, something like that? Um, yeah, in, in, your, uh, in your mind, you know, sometimes you think of a big bureaucracy as inefficient or, you know, uh, ineffective. Was, was it a good thing to do? So the department was created out of a, a feeling that um, uh, there needed to be a greater capacity within the federal government to so-called connect the dots. And so they uh, put within the department um, all the agencies that deal with uh, border security, be they land, be they air, be they sea, maritime. Uh, they put within their disaster response they put within their protection of critical infrastructure. Um, they put uh, in there um, all of the elements of immigration from immigration enforcement uh, to um, uh, running the processes by which um, uh, uh, people actually become naturalized uh, citizens. Um, uh, so it's, um, it's Customs and Border Protection, it's FEMA, it's the Secret Service, it's the Coast Guard, uh, it's Immigration and Customs Enforcement, it's um, uh, the TSA. Um, and, uh, and, and so it is a management uh, challenge. And one of the things uh, we tried to do, I was only the third secretary, 
uh, was uh, to take all these disparate departments who came from different legacy departments. Some came from the Department of Transportation, Department of the Treasury, uh, Department of Justice, uh, et cetera. Um, uh, but to really kind of create one overall mission statement. And then we really tried to prioritize six or seven major things that we were going to try to try to tackle. Um, and, you know, we, we just sent about, you know, trying to do our best and, and trying to bring this effort together. Um, you know, the department is, um, uh, came into being in 2003. Um, it's still very young by federal department uh, standards. Uh, it's still coming together. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think, you know, with every succeeding secretary, there's more that is done and can be done there. So, um, uh, but, it, but it is um, a management challenge, no doubt. One uh, element of um, the department is, of course, as you mentioned, is ICE. Uh, among the uh, progressive factions of the Democratic base, uh, there's some talk about ICE should be eliminated or it should be overhauled in some dramatic way. What are your thoughts? So um, uh, I don't think it should be abolished. Um, I do think uh, it, it needs a, a stronger sense of priority in terms of how it is going to do enforcement and removal operations. Um, uh, it shouldn't just be let loose in, in communities. Uh, we instituted uh, priorities uh, for enforcement and removal operations when I was secretary. 90% of the uh, in removals uh, fell within those priorities. Um, uh, unfortunately, in the current administration, they, they've kind of erased all of that. Um, you know, the, you know, immigration enforcement is, is very difficult, very controversial. Um, uh, you don't make anyone happy. Uh, and, um, uh, but, but yet every country is, is entitled to have uh, strong borders and uh, to have processes by which people uh, can um, remain in the country and be citizens of that country and so forth. What we really need, and I think the likelihood of this is uh, next to zero, unfortunately, is immigration reform. Uh, and um, to me, that means a combination of Southwest border security, visa reform, and then a process by which those who are undocumented in the country now can uh, get right with the law and ultimately uh, earn their way to citizenship. I mean, that to me is a package that makes sense. Yeah, it is. And, a, and certainly a, a heavy lift in this political environment, yeah, to say the least. No doubt. Let's go to uh, some audience questions. Here's one on uh, how do you balance safety and privacy? And I would just add to the, the question in your book, you talk about the original Pri uh, Patriot Act may have uh, gone too far in some of the concerns about privacy and civil liberties where the concerns were justified. Yeah, I think so. And, but, but, you know, we have to understand the time. Uh, the aftermath of 2001, I mean, there was just a, a, just a, a, ter a terrific and understandable national angst about were we going to be attacked again, by whom, how would we know ahead of time uh, uh, how would we better protect the country? Uh, and, and so I think, you know, the first pass at the Patriot Act um, probably did go too far. Um, you know, at DHS, um, uh, we tried to, to not think of privacy and security as always in conflict, i.e., uh, if you advantage one, you have to disadvantage the other. Um, but to um, build on a theory of, of what we thought of as privacy by design, so that when we were uh, developing new technologies, um, when we were developing new protocols or procedures, uh, we, we thought of privacy and civil liberties as part of that decision-making process. 
and, and try to incorporate those thoughts um, from, from the get-go. So I'll give you an example. Uh, remember the, full, uh, the, the first version of the full body scanners in airports? Um, okay, they were not popular. Um, <laughs> and, and they were not popular because the, the, the initial, they were, they were needed, by the way, because of the threats we were constantly getting of people trying to get uh, explosives onto planes. Um, but uh, they were not popular because the, the picture was kind of very individual and very you know precise and 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 intrusive, and um, but but we quickly got our vendor to move to uh, a simple silhouette, which would actually be viewed by somebody uh, in, in another room, uh, not at the uh, at the site where the passenger was. Um, and in, in a fashion that couldn't be downloaded or shared or anything of, of that sort. Um, you know, one of my uh, regrets uh, was um, uh, by the time I left DHS, we hadn't uh, figured out a technology that allowed people to keep their shoes on and carry liquids on, onto planes. Um, if we had, maybe I'd be running for president. I, 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 I don't know. But the technology we'll just- We'll get to that question. It, it simply wasn't there. Um, and so we, we addressed it in another way, which was to say, look, um, not all passengers are the same. And where we know information about passengers and we can kind of pre-verify them before they show up at the security line, we can put them uh, uh, through a magnetometer, they can keep their shoes on, they don't have to do the full body scanner and so forth. And we, we uh, developed a TSA PreCheck. Anybody here in PreCheck? Yeah, All right, okay. Um, uh, and uh, the whole notion behind PreCheck was, look, if, if, if we don't have the technology for everybody, we can do some risk mitigation and uh, um, using those theories um, uh, help some people through the lines. In terms of uh, personal privacy, certainly people worry about what government has, but certainly one of the things that has changed since 2001 is, is the private sector has so much. I mean, with our smartphones, I mean, it's not just Facebook and Google, but all these apps that have ways to, to track you. I mean, is it, is it a lost cause? <laughs> um, you know, I, uh, what people um, uh, give up uh, um, to a, 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 a private sector uh, vendor or an app or what have you is, is in, in some respects, that person's uh, choice. Um, uh, what I think we should be and what we can be concerned with is government um, interference and government uh, accumulation of personal private information and possible misuse by, by the government. So, um, but the law in this area is now changing uh, and uh, you know the Supreme Court has uh, had some cases over the last couple years, I'm sure they'll be getting more and they're gonna have to wrestle with the concept of what is a reasonable expectation of privacy in this modern era. Is there a sufficient firewall between the public and private sector on this in terms of the information, the data that Facebook or whatever collects uh, on you and the fact that government can get it and a lot of times with those uh, letters that they'll get, they're, they're not even allowed to tell the person that, that they've been given information about them. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I. Uh, there are there are firewalls there. Could they be stronger? Yes. Interesting. Um, here's a question on: uh, Do you believe our security has been compromised by the current administration's practice of overriding recommendations to deny clearances to certain cabinet members or or certain White House staff people? Yeah. Certain so relatives of the president. Right. <laughs> Look, the 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 security. The security clearance process is not a joke. Uh, you know, um, 
there are different levels of security clearance, and they're designed to ensure that at, at, at different levels of intelligence information, that the person who has access to that information is not subject to possible compromise, conflict of interest, uh, blackmail, uh, and, and anything else like that. And so, you know, the process, you know, begins, you fill out a form called an SF-86, and it's exhaustive. It's exhausting to fill it out, but it's exhaustive. Um, and then that's reviewed by uh, professionals in the White House. Uh, it's also then um, uh, reviewed by the FBI, and they go back and verify information. They go back and interview uh, your, your colleagues, your neighbors, uh, others who know you. Um, and it's really designed to make sure that individuals with access to confidential information, we can have confidence in um, that, that they, are, um, they are safe repositories for that. It, I think, should bother us all when those judgments made by security professionals are overridden not once or twice, uh, but at least from the press reports, at least 25 times uh, in, in, the, in the White House today. Um, because it kind of undercuts the whole integrity of why we have the clearance process to begin with. I, I'm, I'm very concerned about it. Did you see any examples of that when you were in the Obama administration? No. No. Interesting. Uh, here's a question. On, with all the companies in the security area hundreds of them claiming that they have the solution to hacking. Why are we still vulnerable to getting hacked? Uh, you know, te technology is a wonderful thing and it is a very complicated and rapidly evolving thing. And it is a moving target. And, um, uh, I, you know, I don't know if uh, we will um, ever have a foolproof way of guaranteeing a, a non-hackable system. Uh, but uh, what we need to focus on is how to make our systems, particularly those that protect our infrastructure, less vulnerable to hack, more difficult to hack, um, and um, uh, where if there is a hack, it's immediately detected um, so that attribution can be made and corrective measures taken. I want to ask you a political question. You were elected governor of Arizona, uh, traditionally a, a red state, the state of Perry Goldwater and John McCain and others. Uh, when you look out at the political landscape now, which has become far more polarized, w w what can be done to bring us back where we're not just all vilifying each other and that we're listening to each other and, heaven forbid, Congress can actually get together on some major issues? Hmm. I don't know. What do you think can be done? <laughs> I think people need to read newspapers. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's, it, it, you, you know, I think, um, uh, I think what we have now is not, is neither healthy nor sustainable for the country. Um, and, you know, um, in, in this area, elections really matter. Um, real choices are made in elections. Um, but regardless of who wins or loses, um, you know, I think we need a greater capability of listening to alternative points of view. We also need to be able to insist that um, uh, what's the line, everybody's entitled to their own opinion but not their own facts, um, that, we, that, uh, that we really bring facts to bear on, uh, on important questions of the day. Um, and, you know, I think, uh, you know, politicians respond to votes and voters. And I'm not sure that we reward politicians 
uh, for actively engaging in the art of government and and the art of effective compromise. Um, and uh, one would hope that um, that we are going to work our way out of this moment in history and get to a better place. Um, but it, it couldn't be soon enough for my personal taste. <laughs> What, what effect do you think uh, social media and cable news, particularly as it becomes more ideological, uh, plays into this? I was talking to uh, a member of Congress today for my Sunday column, and, and he was talking about when you're in Capitol Hill right now, the currency is how many likes you have and how many uh, you know, profile visits you have on your social media and how many times you know you can get on one of those uh, either Fox or CNN or MSNBC? He said there's just not that much room left for policy. Do you, do you think those are corrosive influences? Yeah, they are, but they don't they don't have to be. Um, look, we all have our own opinions. We all, you know, we all have our own thoughts about what's better policy for the country. Um, uh, um, but that doesn't mean we ought not to be paying attention to alternatives that are proposed, and maybe even think about them. Uh, uh, and uh, 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 you know, and and I'm you know I'm listening uh, as we go through this uh, presidential campaign, and um, uh, the Democrats obviously have a lot of candidates, and I think we'll have some more bef before time is out. And um, uh, what I what I want to listen for is a candidate who has a very high set of aspirational goals, but a very pragmatic approach to how we, we get there. Um, and that's kind of the marriage that I, I think is the secret sauce for great leadership. I know you're not going to make an endorsement and break news here at the Commonwealth Club tonight, but <laughs> do you see candidates in the Democratic field who fit that profile? I think there are a couple, yeah. A couple. And that's all, that's, all you're, that's all I'm saying. <laughs> okay, well, uh, we might as well dispense with this next question. <laughs> when will you announce that you're running for pre president 2020? <laughs> I, I am not a candidate, nor do I intend <laughs> to be, but thank you. Here's a question. In terms of Homeland Security, what do you think has been currently is and will be the role of China in influencing American policy and actions in, in the grand strategy? Do you see opportunities here for a partnership, if not collaboration with China? Yeah, I don't know about uh, collaboration per se, um, uh, but uh, you know, China is the second largest economy in the world. Um, the projections are that it may surpass the United States in the not too distant future. Um, and we have some real issues with China. We have, uh, um, particularly with respect to the protection of intellectual property and um, uh, the requirements uh, uh, of U.S. companies to have to kind of hand over their intellectual property in order to do business in China. I mean, that's, that's, that, that's just not right. So, um, uh, um, you know, I think it is in our, our nation's interest to um, uh, work with China. Um, I think it's in their interest to work with us. Um, but this is, this is a, uh, a very significant bilateral relationship that we are going to have to have over the next decades. When you look out across the world, what, what do you think are our number one adversaries in terms of, is it Russia, is it Iraq, is it non-state actors, someone I'm not thinking of? So, um, it, it, first of all, um, uh, Terrorism still exists. International terrorism still exists. Um, uh, you know, Al Qaeda itself is a is a little long in the tooth. Osama bin Laden is dead, um, but 
other Islamist groups have uh, uh, developed, and so we, we can't lose sight of those. In terms of state actors, um, I would say Russia. Uh, I would say Iran. Uh, uh, I would say North Korea um, would be my, my top three. I see. Um, the, in your book, you talked about how the uh, Obama administration in some ways was a little too reticent in confronting its critics. You pointed out, for example, like you had the nickname Big Sis. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> how did that come about, and, and what do you mean by how was the Obama administration slow in countering its critics? or ineffective in counting, counting its critics? So the Drudge Report nicknamed me Big Sis. Um, and we kind of laughed it off like, you know, you know you've really made it when you've got a nickname in the Drudge Report. Um, <laughs> but what I, what I meant in the book to, uh, is, uh, um, you know, the, the, the name was to kind of suggest this kind of Orwellian presence that was uh, looking into everybody's personal information and uh, uh, depriving people of privacy and civil liberties. And that, and that just wasn't the case. And um, I think it would have behooved, uh, behooved us to perhaps take that on a little bit. Yes, in, in fact, the Drudge Report has such reach that Every morning when we um, will look at our statistics on how our stories did online, and suddenly you'll get like an aberration where a story that you wouldn't expect usually having to do with something at City Hall here suddenly has a huge audience since because it was linked by the Drudge, Drudge Report. Oh, so, really? Yeah, yeah, so they yeah. definitely have a factor. Here's a question. Why is the role of Saudi Arabia discounted when it comes to promoting terrorism? Mm. That's, a, that's an interesting one, and because and we know the 9-11 attackers, um, uh, many of them were uh, uh, Saudi. Um, uh, you know, S Saudi has um, been a, an ally of the United States in the Middle East. Um, it has uh, been a uh, conduit of uh, relations between the United States and uh, countries in the United in the in the Middle East that we don't necessarily have a good relationship with. Uh, it has uh, uh, been a, a very good um, intelligence gatherer and sharer of um, uh, actionable intelligence um, uh, that we used and we used. Um, uh, to protect uh, Americans, um, uh, and and so um, you know, one of the um, uh, I I think real uh, interesting and difficult issues for the current administration is um, what do we do about our relationship with with Saudi, uh, uh, with. Uh, the actions of uh, Mohammed bin Salman and uh, the murder of Khashoggi uh, um, and other act, act, the war in Yemen, I mean, other things that really are not consistent with American values or American interests. Um, and um, uh, I'm, I, I, I must say I'm befuddled by what our approach is as a country. What do you think uh, an appropriate response could have been, should have been? Well, uh, uh, first of all, I'll say the, the administration did not call me for my opinion. <laughs> um, uh, they might be watching though, so. <laughs> yeah, um, you know, one, uh, 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 one approach uh, uh, would have been uh, to uh, work with other members of the royal family. Uh, um, to see whether there was an alternative leader um, that, that could be um, uh, elevated in Saudi. Um, that now I'm just saying, speaking off the top of my head, which is always a dangerous thing to do, but uh, it, there, would, there may have been a, and probably are some options there. On balance, you, you mentioned some of the positive uh, things from the relationship with the, the Saudis. On balance, is this a, a productive, positive relationship for the United States? 
It has been historically. Um, I'm not so sure it's that positive now. Just not sure. How much do you think um, resolving the Palestinian question is critical to stabilizing that region and thus helping U.S. security? Well, s stabilize. You know the um, the. First of all, I don't think we stabilize that region um, without resolving the Palestinian question. Um, and um, uh, whether it's a two-state solution or some other approach, um, but to me, that kind of gets to the, the, the heart of, you know, you, you got to solve that question to uh, solidify Israel's um, security, uh, and we have a keen interest and support of Israel. Um, and um, that, in turn, um, would help stabilize the region. Okay, here's a question. Uh, in addition to hardening defenses, would you agree, I always like those would you agree questions, <laughs> that a systematic approach to teaching and promoting goodwill and its attendant moral values in a civic tax supportable way is also a critical role for all sectors, including the University of California. Yeah, so, um, uh, you know, how we educate and what we educate and um, uh, how we prepare the next generation uh, for uh, their place in the world, um, those are things I think about all the time in, in, in my current role. And um, one of the things that um, I, 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 I hope we do, um, but it requires some intentionality, is uh, to educate individuals to be uh, critical thinkers, active listeners, and civic participants, and to understand that everybody in this country has a role to play. Um, and you can't just leave it to Congress or leave it to a governor or leave it to whomever. This is, this is a representative democracy, and everybody has a role. And you've got to prepare yourself for that role. Are you finding that the students <laughs> I agree. <laughs> Are you finding that the students who come to the University of California have, that, have those values, have that quest for uh, knowledge, and actually also have that basic understanding of how our government and how the world works? You know, I think the extent uh, to which we teach civics now is really, uh, it's not consistent. Um, and so, uh, but one of the advantages of a great university education is you can, you know, fill those gaps and uh, uh, hopefully introduce our students to um, uh, all, all of these, you know, you know, all of the things that go into the state and into the country that, uh, um, to which, you know, they will, like I said before, have a responsibility and a role. And you're seeing that global perspective, people going into, uh, young students going into uh, learning about the world history and foreign affairs? Yeah, so, um, and, uh, you know, we have hundreds of different majors and hundreds of, uh, and thousands of students, and so they're, they're, testing the waters and experimenting all the time with different things. That's part of what makes the university exciting. Here's a question. It was announced today that the Domestic Terrorism Intelligence Group is being disbanded. disbanded. Have you heard about this? And what do you think the ramifications of that would be? So this is an issue. Uh, so in the Department of Homeland Security, there's a division called Intelligence and Analysis. And um, uh, as, as part of that division, they had a group on domestic um, terrorism. Uh, and a lot of that uh, in this era is white nationalist, right-wing extremist um, uh, uh, motivated um, terrorism. Uh, and, um, you know, I don't know whether they have just gotten out of the business or whether they've simply kind of reorganized and put those analysts in in other areas, but the work is still going to be done. Um, but 
we we would uh, put out uh, lots of intelligence bulletins and uh, products for uh, local law enforcement, uh, what we were seeing, uh, what they should pay attention to, uh, um, and um, uh, you know, I, you know, the responses we always got from local law enforcement was, you know, keep it coming. So, uh, you know, uh, whether it's this, is, this is just an administrative reorg or actually, like I said, getting out of the business, I can't tell. I spent some time in uh, Asia this past summer looking at the rise of authoritarianism and, and populism in the world, countries like uh, the Philippines and Malaysia. And certainly uh, one thing that struck me was how much of the, uh, the rhetoric of President Trump was being echoed by these leaders like Duterte in the Philippines, for example. He didn't even start using the term fake news until he <laughs> saw it on the satellite from Washington. Do you... What is, how does that affect our national security that we have these authoritarian regimes and, and populism rising around the world? Well, I look at it another way, which is, um, you know, um, uh, security is, um, security of the homeland um, requires really good international partners and allies. Uh, we're dependent on each other for the collection and exchange of actionable intelligence. Uh, we're dependent uh, uh, on each uh, other for, um, you know, uh, things as mundane as how we ex inspect cargo at ports. Well, you gotta inspect cargo at ports if you wanna make sure that no nuclear material is transversing a port. Um, and so the notion that uh, America can go it alone in the world really undercuts overall our actual security. Um, the stronger our alliances, the stronger our partnerships, the stronger our safety. And that's particularly true with NATO. Um, I visited there back in the late 1990s and, and was really uh, struck by how all these other NATO allies we're willing to defer to the United States. The United States was really leading that. I mean, it, as President Trump notes, I mean, we do pay a higher share, but at the same time, it's basically our organization. Well, and let's remember that Article 5 of the NATO Treaty, which is the article that says that an attack on one will be viewed as an attack on all. The, the first time that was really uh, uh, utilized was in the response to 9-11. Yeah. Uh, um, where the countries of NATO all came together and, and to, to help the United States. Uh, so it's not all one way is the point. You mentioned uh, North Korea is one of the threats out there, and, and that certainly has been uh, difficult for many administrations. I remember when uh, Al Gore was running for president, came through the editorial board, and he was asked about the North Korean policy. He said it's constructive ambiguity. <laughs> in other words, they, they don't know exactly what we're going to do. I don't know that uh, it's, the current policy has been constructive ambiguity as much as uh, constru <laughs> constructive whiplash. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What do you think uh, in terms of uh, the president's approach to North Korea and, and trying to in threaten them and then engage them and, you know, he and Kim, Kim Jong-un, you know, falling in and out of love, as he puts it. Uh, are, are we on the right course there? You know, I, uh, you know I, I, I always think it's better to engage than not engage. Um, I think engagement does better when it's really um, prepared and uh, thought through. Um, and I'm not sure what we have actually uh, achieved in terms of reducing uh, the risk of um, deployment of a nuclear uh, weapon by, by North Korea. I also, you know, uh, just swinging across the, the world, uh, um, th think it would have been much better if we had remained in the Iran uh, nuclear agreement. While not perfect, it went a long way 
to uh, making sure that if Iran were really trying to convert um, uranium into weaponizable material, that we would have had really early red flags and the opportunity to intervene. And I'm not sure what we gained by withdrawing from that. Nuclear proliferation was not one of your top three, but certainly that's got to be in the top five, I'm sure, uh, especially with the you know, uh, breakup of the Soviet Union and its, you know, materials going elsewhere. Where, do, where does that rate on your, your scale? So we always were, um, you know, uh, uh, cognizant of the, the risk of nuclear material uh, floating around the world. Um, like I said, um, uh, uh, just in terms of ports and port security and, uh, uh, managing all, all of that around the world. Um, th this was always something that was uh, uh, always, in, you know, as a, as a, a risk. Um, it's one of those things that may be low likelihood, but if it were to occur, would be massive in terms of impact. So y you, you cannot ignore it. Um, and anything we can do to reduce that risk to... Uh, uh, slow down the nuclear clock that Jerry Brown now is responsible for, um, uh, uh, I think is, is, is to our benefit. I see. Another audience question. Uh, given the downsizing of our government agencies, along with a corresponding decrease in data, i.e. weather, agriculture, commerce, how much added risk does this present to our national security? First of all, do you accept the premise that we've downsized yeah, I'm not sure I accept that premise. Um, uh, I will say at the Department of Homeland Security, one of the things that um, was um, within our umbrella uh, was uh, the, um, the uh, safety of the nation's food supply from any kind of bioterrorism uh, type of uh, attack. Uh, and we operated uh, several level four labs um, uh, uh, in that regard and um, worked very heavily and closely with the agricultural industry to um, mitigate the risk of something like that happening, keeping the food supply safe. You know, a number of people point out that, um, you know, white nationalism, domestic terrorists, uh, uh, present uh, at least as much of a threat to the United States as foreign terrorists. Is it given, um, in, during your tenure and now, as much attention, a much, as much concern as it should? I think it's a growing concern. And what's, um, you know, it's, it's interesting. There's so somewhat different federal players depending on whether you're talking about an international terrorist attack or a domestic uh, terrorist attack. Um, and, um, uh, you know, if it's international, you've got the Department of Defense, you've got the NSA, um, they're all over it. If it's uh, domestic, it's the FBI, it's, uh, the, it's the DHS. Uh, um, and, you know, so it kind of makes a difference, although when you think about it, e either way, if there's a successful attack, people die. Um, and, uh, you know, this is w one of those areas where perhaps the federal government is not as well organized as it could be. Final question. Uh, you've had such an amazing career, governor of Arizona, head of Homeland Security, now president of the University of California. Which of those jobs has been the most enjoyable? <laughs> and which has been the most challenging? <laughs> Look, I love being president of the University of California. I mean, <laughs> you know, it, 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 yeah, it's, it's hard to beat that. Uh, and every job I've had has had opportunities and challenges. Uh, being the DHS secretary, that is a very challenging role. I'll just leave it there. <laughs> very good. Well, please join me in thanking Janet Napolitano. Thank you. Thanks, John. Pre President of the University of California, former Secretary of Homeland Security, as I mentioned, 
and author of that new book, How Safe Are We? Homeland Security Since 9-11. I also want to thank our audiences here and on radio, television, and the internet. I want to remind everyone here that uh, Janet Napolitano's book is for sale outside the room, and she will sign books on stage following the program. If you want your book signed, please stay seated for further instructions following the program. And with that, I'm John Diaz, and now this meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California, the place where you are in the know, is adjourned. <laughs>